thank y'all so much. I'm so blessed to, uh, to be here this morning and to uh, preach the Word of God and to have this wonderful time of fellowship. If you all would, please open up your Bibles with me to the book of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. The book of 2 Corinthians. And we're going to look at chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 5, and we're going to look right at the end of the chapter at verse 21. 2 Corinthians 5.21 reads this. Paul writes, he says, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the fellowship of other believers. We thank you for these wonderful hymns of praise that we can lift up to you. We thank you for your word and the truth of it. We thank you that we um, have the privilege and opportunity this day to hear your word taught uh, and to hear what you have to say to us through your holy word. And Lord, I just pray that it would affect each of us profoundly and that each and every one of us uh, would be transformed uh, and that we would be sanctified and that we would be conformed to the image of your son, Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray and it's in, to him that we bring all the glory. Amen. All righty. 2 Corinthians 5.21. One verse in all of Scripture. One of the central verses to our understanding of the gospel. The Bible testifies that each of us, whether we are uh, great, whether we have much wealth, or whether we're poor and we're considered small in this world, it testifies that each of us have broken God's law. We have we have, we have broken His law, and because of our sin, we are sinners before God by default and condemned to hell, each of us. But the Bible also testifies to the grace of God, that He gives us forgiveness of sins, that He uh, clothes us in righteousness, that we get to go to heaven. God acquits those who have broken His law and are guilty of it. He forgives sinners. I mean, look at us. We, we've all been forgiven. We've all been saved. But how can it be that God can do that? How can God forgive people of their sin? How can God give people the gift of everlasting life and still be just? Can God do that? Or does God have to sacrifice His justice in order to give us mercy? Or does God have to sacrifice His mercy in order to give us justice? Because the Bible testifies that God is both merciful and He's just. So that we have a conundrum in the Scriptures. How can God forgive us? How can God save somebody? How can God, as the Bible words it, justify somebody? How can He? And that's the mystery of reconciliation. It's the mystery that Paul answers here in this verse. See, Paul understood that. He understood that there's a mystery to this reconciliation. How can a man be made right with God and God still be just? How can it legally happen? And so here Paul reveals to us the glorious mystery of reconciliation. And what that glorious mystery is, is, is called, the theologians call it the great exchange. The great exchange that our sin was put to Christ's account and His righteousness is in turn put to ours. And that's what we will spend the entire sermon studying, is this great exchange that happens between a sinner and the Lord Jesus Christ. And it shows us that the mercy of God is abundant, the justice of God is abundant at the same time. And they are both beautifully intertwined, and they both beautifully flow together. And that shows us the manifold wisdom of God, that God is, He knows all things. He knows how to perfectly design salvation so that it glorifies His mercy, it glorifies His justice, and ultimately it glorifies His Son, Jesus. And so that's what we'll see as we go through this text. Now, before we do, we always do this with Scripture, is we look at the context, what surrounds the verse. So as we step back from this book as a whole, we know that Paul wrote this book, 2 Corinthians, to the church at Corinth, obviously. And uh, in this book, Paul writes on a lot of different issues, but specifically in chapter 5, he is dealing with the temporal and the eternal. He's dealing with a lot of theological concepts, and he's trying to explain to the Corinthians. And if you look with me, if you go with me to verse, uh, verse 17 of the chapter... We're going to read that, and we're going to get a good understanding of where Paul's coming from as he leads up to uh, verse 21. So look with me at verse 17. Paul writes these words. He says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. 
So there we see Paul introduces to us the doctrine of regeneration. That when you are saved, you, have, you become a new creation. You're, you're completely changed from the inside out. So that's the first thing Paul says. You know a man is, is a new creature when he comes to Jesus Christ. And then he continues, he says, the old things passed away. The old new things have come. Verse 18, now all these things are from God. Now I want you to listen to this next word, or these, these next two words. He says, who reconciled us to himself. There it is. There it is right there. There's a mystery. How can God reconcile sinners to himself. Because the Bible says that sin cannot dwell in the presence of God. We cannot approach God because of our sin. The Bible says we are cut off from God. We are alienated because of our unrighteousness. So how can we, as unrighteous sinners, approach a righteous God? Paul says it here. He says God reconciled us to himself. He has brought us near to himself. But how has he done that? Look what he says. Through Christ. And gave us the ministry of reconciliation. What Paul's saying is, it's just a different way. He's wording it saying, God gave us the gospel. That is the message. That is the ministry of reconciliation. The gospel reveals to us how God can bring filthy sinners like ourselves to himself. Verse 19, he continues. He says, namely, so he's about, to, he's about to give us details. He says, namely that God was in Christ. In other words, Jesus is almighty God. He says, re reconciling the world to himself. In other words, not only is it just a couple of sinners, it's, it's a whole multitude of sinners. Jesus came to save a multitude of people for his glory. He says, not counting their trespasses against him. There it is. How can God justly do that? How can we break his law and he not count our law breaking against us? Because if he forgives us of our law breaking and does not deal with the sin, then he's not just. God is not just. And that's a terrifying thing. Because then what? Then how do we know God's going to deal with us rightly? But at the same time, if God has no mercy, then we will all be, we, then we'll all deserve justice and we'll all immediately go to hell. So how do, the, how do those things both flow beautifully together? And that is the mystery of the gospel. And he continues. He says, And he committed to us the word of reconciliation, the gospel. Verse 20. Therefore, Paul says, we are ambassadors for Christ. In other words, we, the children of God, are ambassadors. In other words, what, what does that mean? What does that word mean? Well, it's, it, it's really a royal word. It's used in, 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 in language and talking about kings and kingdoms. See, when a king wanted to give an edict or a command, who would he send? An ambassador. Someone who had the authority of the king, though themselves necessarily were not the king, but they had the authority of the king to make a proclamation in his name. To make a proclamation in the name of a king. And, they, and they, what they said carried with it the authority of the king. So too do we have a, a, a word to, to proclaim to the world from King Jesus. And we carry with that the authority of King Jesus. So he says, this gospel we take to the world. He says, as though God were making an appeal through us. Isn't that amazing? So it's the, the proclaiming of the gospel is so important, is so amazing and so glorious. The Bible says it's as if God is making an appeal through us. In other words, we are prophets in a, in a sense. In a sense, we, because a prophet is someone who thus says the Lord, proclaims the word of God. And then he, the last part of verse 20, we beg you on behalf of Christ... Be reconciled to God. And like I said, we, as we've read these verses, we keep asking ourselves, how can God do that? How can God reconcile us to himself? How can he do it while still remaining remain just and still remaining um, merciful? And then the glorious verse, verse 21, Paul tells us how. So as we go through this verse, we're going to see one thing consistently shown to us through it, and that is the great exchange. So look with me at the first part of that verse there. The first word, we're going, to just, we're going to take this really slow because we want to dig deep. We want to really get our minds wrapped around what this means. How can we be reconciled to God? The first word there in verse 21, it says he. Now, obviously, we know this is God the Father. If you look with me at the last word of verse 20, what is it? God. So we know that the subject here is God. It's God doing the work of salvation. He is active in the gospel. The Father is one of the main focal points of the gospel of Christ. And that's why the Bible calls it the gospel of God. Not the gospel of us. 
not the gospel of Christians, it's the gospel of God. Because it focuses on what He has done for us. If we, when we look through the Bible, when we look specifically through the work of Christ, we see the, God the Father there at, at almost every event. At the baptism, who spoke from heaven? The Father. In all things in Jesus' life, who did Jesus continually rely on? The Father. At Jesus' death, who was there? The Father, pouring out His wrath on Christ for our salvation. At the resurrection, who rose Jesus up from the grave? The Father. At the ascension, who received Him to heaven? The Father. At the exaltation and glory, who, who allowed Christ to sit down at His right hand? The Father. We see the gospel continually focusing on God. It is, it is, it, God is, is one of the main focal points of the gospel. So we need to remember that. Because I think a lot of times in our, in our American Christianity, we think the gospel is about us. It's about what, what we can do for God. But no, the Bible testifies it's, what God, it's about God and what He has done for us. Amen. Look at the next word with me. He made. Now, when you look at this verse, hey, it says He made Him. So we look and we say, well, wait a second. God made Jesus in the sense that He created Him? Well, no. The Bible testifies that Jesus never had a beginning. He will never have an end. That He is co-eternal with the Father. He is eternal God. So there's no way God can have ever been made. So what does it mean when it says that, that God made Him? Because see, if someone like, let's say, a Jehovah's Witness, you know, a, a call of Jehovah's Witnesses, they, they come and they read this verse and say, look, look, right there. Jesus isn't God. He's just a created being. But when we look deep at this word, when we actually go back to the original language in the Greek, the word poieo, it can be translated to make one do something. So it's not that God created Jesus, it's that God commissioned Jesus. God sent Jesus to do something. He made him in that sense of the word. We use this, uh, we actually use this word today in American English. We say, he made him do it. We don't, literally may, we don't literally mean that they created you to do it. We just mean that they, they sent you, they maybe even told you, or gave you a command or an order to do something. It's the same way with uh, this text here. And like I said, that third word there in the, in the verse says, He made Him. Now we know, of course, this is the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. The main focus of the gospel, the centerpiece of the gospel. Any so-called gospel that is not about Jesus Christ is no gospel at all. One of my um, favorite uh, Bible preachers and teachers, he says one time he was going back to talk about Jehovah's Witnesses. He said he was talking to some Jehovah's Witnesses. And he said, tell me the gospel. Tell me what you think the gospel is. And he said for like 15 minutes, they just went on and on about their church and about, you know, you, need, you can join and start reading your Bible and praying and stuff. And he said, he said now, that's, your God, that's the gospel to you. And, he said, yeah. and they said, yeah, that's the gospel. He said, okay. And then he repeated the entire thing back to them. It took him like 15 minutes. Then he said, all right, is that the gospel? And they said, yes. And then he flipped over to 1 Corinthians 15, and he read to them those verses out of 1 Corinthians 15, and it says, here's the gospel, that Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. That's the gospel. Not church, not pews, not, not hymnals, not even uh, worship or praise, not even preaching. That's not the gospel. The gospel is the work of Jesus Christ. That's the good news. And see, the Jehovah's Witnesses and other religions of the world, they think they have a gospel. But if it's not focused on the Lord Jesus Christ, it is no gospel at all. Amen. In fact, Paul said in, in the book of Galatians, he said, If, if anyone, <coughs> even an angel from heaven, comes to you and preaches any other gospel, they are to be accursed. In fact, the, the Greek word there is anathema. It's the, it's the most serious and emphatic <coughs> curse that you can possibly give someone in the Greek language. It is like, in other words, let them be damned from God. That's how serious the word is. Even an angel from heaven, if they are to preach to us any other gospel than what we see in the scriptures, let them be anathema. Let them be accursed. And that good news is about Christ and his finished work. Continuing on in the verse, going back to 2 Corinthians 5.21. To recap what we've seen so far, he made him, then look with me at the next part, who knew no sin. Now, what does this mean? We think Jesus didn't know what sin is? No, no, no. That's, again, we have to remember, in light of the, all the scriptures, what this is saying. It's saying Christ knew of, not of sin in the fact that he was not a sinner like we are. See, Jesus is the opposite of what we are. See, we're sinners. We're lawbreakers. We're rebellious. But Jesus is perfectly submissive to the will of God. He was righteous in everything he did. He was holy and pure. And he was the perfect spotless lamb of God. 
In Hebrews 4.15, the writer of Hebrews writes these words. He says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. So see, Jesus was tempted, but he was without sin. He was without any, any spot or blemish upon him. You know, in the Old Testament, when God commanded the Israelites to sacrifice lambs and goats and bulls, it would always be without blemish. They were, they were to be almost perfect in a sense. They, what was that symbolizing? It was symbolizing the Savior, the perfect Savior, who was coming to save us from our sins. It was pointing us to Christ. That's called a foreshadowing. So when it says he knew, it's not that he knew. It's not that he was ignorant of what sin actually was. He knew. He's Almighty God. He knows everything. But it was that he knew not of it because he himself does not have that sin nature. He does not inherit that sin nature. He was conceived of the Holy Spirit in the womb of Mary, and he lived the perfect life. He never sinned once, never rebelled. Why do you think of the baptism? At the baptism, when Jesus came up out of the water, what came? Well, there was an audible voice. One of the very few times in the Bible does God actually speak in an audible voice. And what did God say? This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. How many in this room can confidently say that if they stood before God, that's what He would say about you? Nobody. Nobody in the history of the world. And yet when, Je and yet when Jesus said at the beginning of His ministry, God the Father spoke audibly from heaven, I am well pleased in Him. That's incredible. That Jesus, the only man who ever lived, to perfectly please the Father in everything He did. Continuing on, we, we saw that um, he made him who knew no sin. Then this is the first part of the great exchange. It says to be sin on our behalf. Like I said, the first part of the great exchange. That our sin was credited to his account. <coughs> he was treated as if he had committed our sin in our place. Literally translated, this text reads, sin on our behalf. Now, you, you may ask, well, what does it mean that Jesus was made sin on our behalf? That he, that he became sin on our behalf? Well, to really understand this, let's look at what it does not mean. Uh, I think when we knock those things out, then we can get a clear understanding. It does not mean that Jesus sinned. It does not mean that Jesus was made a sinner. It does not mean that God the Father sinned. And it doesn't mean that Jesus was forced to sin. It doesn't mean that at all. In light, of what, looking at, in light of us looking at what he did not do, let's look at what he did do. The Greek word for sin here can be translated sin offering. So there it is now. That is very helpful for us to see that Jesus wasn't made sin in the fact that he sinned or that he broke the law of God or that he was made a sinner. But he was made sin in the, in the, in the sense that he was made a sacrifice for sin, an offering for sin. In our, in our place and on our behalf to pay for our sin. It's like this. Let's say that one of us in this room goes and they steal $50,000 from somebody and they assault somebody and they wreck somebody else's car and they, just, they, they rack up a whole amount of, of crimes. And then they stand before a judge and the judge says, you're guilty. Uh, we're going to throw you in prison um, for a long time uh, and your bail is a million dollars. Just a really high bail. And they can't rub two pennies together. They're broke. But out of nowhere, someone comes in and they, they said, I've sold everything I own. I've sold my house, my car. I've sold my business. I've sold myself even into slavery in a third world country. I've got the million dollars cash and they pay it for them and they're free. They walk into the courtroom. And the law has been appeased. Justice has been served. And the guilty walks free. We have that in our legal system. Paying the bail. It's the same way with God. He sent his son Christ to pay the bail that we can never pay. He, he paid the, the payment for us on our behalf. That's what Christ did when he came to this earth. That's what it means when it says he was made sin. In other words, God the Father, at that moment upon the cross, looked upon Jesus as if he had lived, I'll put it more practically, as if he lived my life. As if he had, has committed all the sins that I've committed. As if he has done everything wrong that I've done. And when God did that, he poured out his wrath. The hell that we deserve was put on Christ so that God could now treat us as if we lived Jesus' life. That's the exchange. See, Jesus took upon himself our negative balance. It's like this. Let's say we're in debt. Jesus comes and pays our debt. That's another way to look at it. 
And that's what it means when Jesus was credited with our sin. God credited to his account our negative balance. And he paid it in full. He paid the debt that we owe to God. Also, another analogy that helps to understand this is in public school system. If, if, the, if a teacher is sick or the, you know, they've got a family emergency, they call in a substitute. And they do the job for them. And then uh, the teacher returns the next day and the job was done for them um, on their behalf the day before. Fully. And guess what? They never even had to enter the classroom. It's the same way God called in a substitute. Someone who could do the job for us except perfectly. See, we could try, we could try all day to earn God's favor and we would fail every time. That's what every religion in the world except for biblical Christianity says. Do this, 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 this. Go and um, do penance. Go and see a priest. Go and fast for a month. Go and pray. Go and sing some songs. Go to a church for a while and maybe God will accept you. But the Bible says we can't. We can't do that. We've already broken the law. It's like this. I mean, imagine... I going and, like I said, you know, going and assaulting somebody and stealing $20,000 of the running. And then I stand before the judge. The judge says, well, you're guilty. You're going to have to go to prison. I say, well, judge, don't worry. I, I, yesterday I gave $5,000 to a charity. He's going to say, I'm not judging you for what you did good. I'm judging you for what you did bad. It's the same way with God. He doesn't judge us for what we've done good. He judges us for our bad. And no matter what amount of good we do, our bad is still going to be there. You can't pile a bunch of good and then expect the bad just to disappear. That's wishful thinking. That's not, we're not living in reality. We go past reality when we do that. And that's whatever religion of the world teaches, besides biblical Christianity. That you can't. You can't earn God's favor. Only the Lord Jesus Christ has done it for you. And when you repentantly believe that, God forgives you and saves you so that He gets the glory and you get the grace. That's salvation. And then, I love this part. Here's the second part of the Great Exchange. Going back to the verse, he says, So that. Now, this is explaining, this is conveying to us. Here's the effect. Paul's saying, here is the effect of Jesus being made sin for us. Here's the result of it. Look at it. Look with me, and continuing back at the verse. So that we. Now, we want to be sure we understand who is we here. Now, if you're a universalist, you say, oh, everybody, everybody's going to be saved. That's not what the Bible says. There, there will be some who aren't. There will be some who reject the gospel of Christ. So, who is this we? Well, if we go back to verse 20, Paul says, therefore, we are ambassadors of Christ. Well, that still doesn't really tell us who, because we, Paul was talking about himself and his companions. So, that, that was the apostles and some preachers and teachers. That can't be the only people who are going to be saved. So, if you go back to verse 14 of the chapter, he says... He says in verse 14, he says, For the love of Christ controls us. Okay. Are we, I'm pretty sure that is still Paul and his companions. So that, that, can't be, that can't be the only people who are going to be saved. We'll go back to verse 10. He says, For we must all appear before the judgment of seed of Christ. There it is. All believers, it's all who believe in Christ, are the ones who receive the benefit of his finished work. You must believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You must trust in his salvation. We're not universalists. We don't say, you know what, if you're a Muslim and you deny Christ and you, you go and do the religious system, you'll still be saved. You'll still receive the benefit of Christ's work. No, you won't. If you don't come to Christ on His terms, and if you don't come to Him in repentance and faith, you will not receive the benefit of His work. You will not. That's why Jesus said, I am the way. He didn't say a way. I think, I think in, our, in our religion, uh, religious views today, especially in America... We've now, because of our wanting to be politically correct and, and diverse, we've now said, well, you know, there are many ways to God. That's a direct, direct denying of what the, the Word of God says. Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. I mean, I love that. In that verse, he, he didn't say just, I'm the way, and then he stopped there. He emphatically, three different ways, shows to us the exclusivity of salvation in Jesus. The way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but through Him. So we see, um, so far we've seen in this verse, He made Him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we, so we know now, we being the children of God, those who believe in Christ. Then, look at this word, might. Now you may say, oh wait a second, so now salvation's it may or may not happen? Do you think God would do all that work just to get us to the point where, uh, maybe, maybe you'll be saved. 
No, that's not what the word might is conveying here. This word can also be translated will. It's just simply the choice of the English word. The word might conveys the result. It's that we will become the righteousness of God in Him. And that's what we'll look at here. And like I just said, it says, So that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Now, again, what does this mean? What does that actually mean? Well, let's look at what it does not mean. It does not mean that we actually become righteous people. Because if that's so, none of us are saved and none of us will ever be saved. We don't actually become perfect people after that. We, and secondly, we do not actually, just as I said, we do not actually become perfect. We don't actually become sinless beings. That we're just as holy as God is and we'll never, never once do anything wrong. It's not that at all. I mean, we look at the Old Testament. We see saints in the Old Testament. I mean, look at David. He committed murder and adultery. And he was saved when he did that. I mean, there are, look at Moses. He failed. Look at Abraham. He failed. I mean, he, he rejected, just as we studied on Wednesday night, Abraham, though he had faith in God, though he was justified, he still sinned. I mean, look at Ishmael. He, obeyed, he disobeyed what God had promised and instead acted in the flesh and had a child with another woman besides his wife. And it was outside of the promise of God. And we even studied, we talked about now, who are the descendants of the Ishmaelites? Muslims. The same people who, and not that we hate Muslims, we love Muslims, we want them to come to Christ. But those same people, a lot of them, are radicalized and they want to kill us very Christians. I mean, I think we see the effects of sin throughout history. We see that. So we see righteous men and women throughout the Old Testament who were saved in the eyes of God, but they weren't perfect. They were not perfect by any means. Now let's see what this actually means. What this means is that we are counted as righteous in Christ. We are counted. In other words, we are treated as if we had lived his perfect life. Because he was treated as if he had lived ours. See, that's the exchange. He was treated as if he had committed our sin. And we in turn are treated as if we lived his perfect life of perfect obedience. So when God the Father looks at us... He says, in whom I am well pleased. Praise God, that's the salvation of Christ. It's a full salvation. It's a total salvation. That's why the author of Hebrews said, how can we neglect so great a salvation? I love that wording, so great a salvation. It is so great, so great, it's total. We, and not only that, but look, at, look with me at that verse again. It says, the righteousness of Christ. God, Not just a righteousness, not just mm, kind of righteous, but not all the way. The perfect righteousness of God himself. So when God looks at us, we are perfect in his eyes as he is perfect. But we're actually not in the sense that we are, we've been, become new creatures, yes, but we have, we're still sinners. But God looks at us as if we are just as righteous as he is. That's how we're allowed in heaven, because the only, one, the only way you can enter into heaven is if you are absolutely to the uttermost perfect. None of us can get there, so God declares us perfect through the work of Jesus Christ. And this doctrine is found all throughout Scripture. Romans 4, 5, just as we studied uh, on Wednesday night, it says, To the one who does not work, but believes in Him, in God, who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited or counted as righteousness. In other words... He is treated as if he is righteous, the, in the very righteousness of God. In Philippians 3.9, Paul also testifies to this. He says, I, I want to be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law. In other words, derived from works. I don't want it from works because I'll never get it. But he says, but that righteousness, which is through faith in Christ, which is through faith in the gospel, that righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. It's not from our work, it's not from our input, but it's by the finished work of Christ. Paul understood that. What was the object of his faith? Was it himself? Was it the law? Was it a priest or even a pastor? What was it? It was Christ. That's the basis for our justification. That is the, the ground upon which we are justified. Why do you think the, uh, the, old, the hymn writer wrote my favorite hymn? On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Because he understood that salvation and justification only comes about on the ground of the finished work of Christ. 
Lastly, the last two words of that verse we're going to look at. It says, in him. Ultimately, this salvation, this perfect righteousness is only found in Christ. Nowhere else is it found. Not in ourselves, not in a church, not in a pastor, not in a religious system, not even in a book. It's found in Christ, in the person of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Only in Him. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. Romans 8, 1, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And may we be diligent, may we be diligent to go out of this place and meditate on this truth, think on this truth, and be sure that our faith is planted in this truth. That this is the object of faith, the faith of our faith. That this great exchange is where we look for our salvation. This man, the man Christ Jesus, the mediator, the only mediator between God and man, is where we look for salvation. Is the one in whom we trust for our justification. And if we have already trusted him, we'll praise God and let this truth, this truth that we have been saved by, let it continually transform us. Because I'll tell you right now, brethren, if, you don't, if you're not living on this day by day, if you're not preaching this to yourself and to others, then you, you've missed it. You've gone past Christianity. You may be saved, but you, you've, you've left the heart of, of, of what it's all about. You've left the heart of the faith. As I love the Puritans. They always said, you'll never graduate from the gospel. And the, the great reformer, Martin Luther, he said, to progress is to begin again. And what he meant by that was that we continually, on a daily basis, even a moment-by-moment -moment basis, go back to this truth over and over and over and over and over. It never ends. The whole Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, testifies to this glorious truth. That's what it's about. That's what it is all about. Is being reconciled to God through the finished work of Christ, through the great exchange that He took upon Himself our sin, and in turn gives us the glorious robes of His righteousness. And we are justified by that. That's where it is, my brethren. And that's where the, you know, why do you think the Bible says, be joyous? What is joy? How can we find joy? There it is, right there. It says, have peace. How can we have peace? There it is, right there. And go on and so forth. And continuing on. Have, have kindness. How can we, why would we be kind to other people? Because God's been kind to us. Look at what He did in Christ. I mean, everything in the Bible is built on this. Everything. Pray. Have a prayer life. Why should we pray? Look at what God's done for us. Why would we not want to pray to such a great God? I mean, you can draw everything back to this. That's what we, that's, uh, theologians call this Christocentric. It means that Jesus is the center of it all. The gospel, the great exchange, is the center of everything. Not only our faith, not only um, the Bible, not only Christianity, but it literally is the center of all existence, of the entire world, of the entire universe. I mean, this is how God gets the glory. This is how God gets the praise. Because this system of salvation says that we are sinners. We cannot earn it by our works. We receive it by faith. No work on our part. So God gets the glory and the honor and praise. And we get the grace. We get the salvation. It is, it is a wonderful thing. And in the end, just as we sing to Him, to God be the glory, great things He has done. What are these great things? The great exchange. The ministry of reconciliation. Those are the great things He's done. And that's what the Bible testifies to Every book, every word. And may we be diligent to put our faith in it. And if we have already, continually put our faith in it and walk in it and proclaim it. And like even that, the Bible says, take the gospel to all nations. Well, if we know the message of gospel, then we we'll want to take it. Because this is a beautiful good news. This is a beautiful thing. We know, well, it testifies, yes, that sinners are under the wrath of God, but it gives them hope for salvation through the grace of God as revealed in Christ Jesus so what we've seen here is the great exchange that Christ was treated as if he committed all, all of our sin, and we in turn were treated as if we lived his perfect life. And we receive that the moment we simply believe the promises of God, just as our father Abraham did. Take God at his word, and we'll be justified. That is the message of the gospel. And may we be diligent to live in that and find our hope, find our life in that. Because the Bible says... Each of us have transgressed the law of God. He said, you, God said, you should not lie or steal or blaspheme. Yet, what have we done? We've lied, we've stolen, we've blasphemed. Those are just three of the commandments of God. Just three of God's commandments. And we've broken those. Imagine if we <coughs> measured ourselves up to all ten of God's commandments. We would be guilty of every single one of them. 
And because of our sin, each of us are alienated from God, we are under His wrath, and we are condemned to hell. Each of us, by default, condemned to hell. But God is a merciful God. And just as we've seen in this wonderful text, it's that God has provided salvation in His grace and in His love and His mercy, while still upholding His justice, His righteousness, and His holiness. All the attributes of God are found in the gospel. All the wondrous things of the person of God are found in the gospel. And he sent his son, Jesus, to live the life we could not live. He fulfilled the law of God in his perfect life. Jesus said, I did not come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill it. That's Matthew 5. And we just, we talked about the baptism. God said, I am well pleased in you. And then he went to the cross. And at the cross, he was beat and he was, he was tortured. And he hung there upon that cross for hours under the wrath of God, being treated as if he had committed all of our sin. And taking upon himself the wrath of God and satisfying him. And then after three days, God the Father rose his son up as the evidence that he had accepted his sacrifice. That the payment, the legal transaction had been made. And then after 40 days, Jesus went back to a mountain and ascended into the glories of heaven. And he is seated there now in heaven at the right hand of God's throne, exalted and receiving all the praise and all the glory. And the Bible testifies that if you were to be saved... If anyone is to be saved, they must simply repent. And what repent means is change your mind about the life of sin you've been living, about the gospel of Christ. And then the second thing is simply to believe. Believe what God has done for sinners in Christ. Believe this good news. And when you do that, God will forgive you of your sins mercifully and justly because Jesus was treated as if he'd committed all of them. And not only that, but because Jesus lived the life you could not live, he credits that righteousness of Jesus Christ to your account, and you are justified, perfect in the eyes of God, holy and pure, not by your work, but by the finished work of Christ and by the free gift and free grace of God. And you'll forever be saved and forever be a child of God. And lastly, that evidence of salvation, just as we read in verse 17 of this chapter, you will be a new creation in Christ. You will be changed. Your thoughts, your words, your actions, your deeds, just as I've been changed, and just as many people in this room have been changed by the grace of God and for the glory of God in Jesus' name. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for your wonderful word. Thank you for this ministry of reconciliation. Lord, we thank you for the great exchange. Thank you for your son, Jesus, Lord God. May you work in each of us, ultimately, for your glory, for your praise, and for your name. And for the glory of your Son, Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.